Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker, and I am an author, speaker, and the professor of Holy Land Studies at the Israel Bible Center. I am passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. And I love having geeky conversations with people about new things. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members and guests at IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. These are some of my favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. On this week's episode, we get to hear a portion of a recent roundtable talk between Dr. Yeshaya Gruber and Dr. Jack Levison. Their discussion is based on Dr. Levison's book, The Holy Spirit Before Christianity, in which Dr. Levison argues against making this massive distinction between the Old and New Testaments and how the Spirit of God is present. In his book and in the Round Table Talk, he focuses on Isaiah 63 and Haggai 2. In this episode, however, we are only going to look at Isaiah 63. But first, before we dive in, what is the language that is used for the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of the Lord? You may be familiar with the Hebrew word ruach, often translated as breath or wind. But how does Dr. Levison define the spirit of the Lord? Lean in and enjoy the conversation. I think Ruach is, in essence, divine presence in our world. I mean, that's awfully, awfully vague. What what was the, uh, there was a Jewish rabbi in the early 20th century who wrote, uh, Abelson, uh, and, and I think he used the word presence in the title of the book uh, on Ruach. In essence, it is the presence of God in the world. But that means, so what I like to do is I like to hyphenate in, in English. I like to talk about spirit breath or spirit wind. God's presence is not defined by any particular mode of presence. In Numbers 11, the Ruach that is upon Moses is taken and given to the 70 elders. And they, I think it's a bad translation, and they prophesy. And then, you know, Eldad and Medad, they are not at the tent and they prophesy as well. So here you have the Ruach on Moses enabling the elders to help Moses adjudicate all the suits that are coming to him, all the lawsuits. And then in the very next paragraph, a Ruach from the Lord comes from the east and brings quail. Now, the interesting thing about Numbers 11 is the Ruach that is on Moses that authorizes the elders to help him adjudicate all the suits that are coming to him. It's described as the Ruach that's upon Moses. It's a little ambiguous as to whether that's Ruach of Lord or Ruach of God. But when you come to the the wind, it's the Ruach from the east, which is from the Lord. And that's unequivocally from God. And so in Numbers 11, you have this very strange juxtaposition. One that the elders receive, which seems like it would be Ruach, clearly the divine spirit. But it's not clearly the divine spirit. It's the Ruach that is upon Moses something of Moses' spirit. But then when you turn to the wind, it's unequivocally divine ruach. I think that's a case that makes us say we can't talk about wind, breath, spirit with a small s for the human spirit and spirit with a large s for the capital, for the, you know, the divine spirit. God's ruach is presence in all sorts of ways, Not no less way a wind that brings quail from a spirit that causes the elders to prophesy. So for me, in essence, it's divine presence, but it can't be sliced and diced into different ways of understanding presence. It it, it all belongs together. This particular roundtable talk is really fantastic and 
kind of different from other talks because there are a lot of visuals. As you listen to the conversation, Dr. Gruber puts Hebrew, English, and the Septuagint Greek text on the screen, and Dr. Levison masterfully draws our attention to all these relevant details. They talk through the lament in Isaiah 63. So I extracted some of the big ideas from their conversation, but I think you will be interested interested in the entire conversation. I will put a link to this roundtable talk in the episode notes. But let's start first with trying to understand how this poetry in Isaiah 63 is functioning. This lament is going to be about the Exodus and why that God was present then and God is no longer present now. So it's actually a communal lament. And in the next few verses, 10 through 12, it's going to be all Exodus language. So I think what's going on here is you have a combination of two concepts. This is a unique, unique expression in the Hebrew Bible, angel of his presence. Uh, The agent, in my opinion, goes back to Exodus 23, where God promises to send an agent or an angel or a messenger to lead the people to the promised land. And they are not supposed to rebel against that angel because God says, my name is in him. So I think what you have here is on the one hand, the notion of the angel, the Malak, goes back to Exodus 23 and the angel that would lead the people in the Exodus and into the promised land. I think presence comes from, is a distillation from Exodus 33. That's that wonderful, terrible text where Moses and God are speaking face to face and arguing about who's going to go with the people. And God says, I'm not going to go up with you. And finally, after Moses and God go back and forth and back and forth, God says, my presence will go with you. Hmm. I think what's happening in Isaiah 63 is an amalgamation, a coalescence, a merging of the angel of Exodus 23 with the presence that goes with them in Exodus 33, into this single divine being, agent of his presence. So I think it's an exegetical basis for this communal lament, rooted squarely in the Exodus. Are you ready to dig in? You may want to grab your Bible and read along. I'll start with reading verse 8, just to set the context, and then move to verse 9, which is going to be discussed by Dr. Gruber and Dr. Levison. They will compare the Hebrew and the Greek together. So this is the English translation. In verse 8, it says, He said, Surely they are my people, children who will be true to me, and so he became their Savior. Verse 9 is the text we're focusing on. In all their distress, he too was distressed, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them, and he lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. So you have the text in the Hebrew, in all their, this is extremely difficult, but in all their distress was he distressed and the agent of his presence rescued them. But notice how different the Septuagint is, um, out of all affliction. And so the Septuagint is tying it to what comes before, which is fine. But then notice what happens. It was no ambassador or angel but the Lord himself that saved them. The Septuagint has given an interpretation that's exactly the opposite of the Hebrew. And the reality is the statement is so strong in the Septuagint, it's clearly got theological reflection going on. I don't know if I use the word theological appropriately here. It's clearly got exegetical or theological reflection going on. It's not just a translation of the first line in the Hebrew there. It's the, if it is, it's a translation of that first line in a certain way with a lot of theological uh, buttressing to make clear it was not an ambassador, it was not a Moloch, 
it was the Lord that saved him. And, and it's the Lord himself. It's altas kurios. So it's emphatic, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. the Lord himself. So it, even if it was the translation, I think it's been buttressed by a highly kind of the wrong word to use, but a highly monotheistic. Oh, this is only God who rescued them at the Exodus. The angel was not the rescuer. So God's name may have been in the angel. The angel may have been leading them, but the angel did, you know, did not rescue them according to the Septuagint. So the Hebrew text said that in all of their distress, he too was distressed and the angel of his presence saved them. Then in verse 10, it says, they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned and became their enemy and he himself fought against them. Wow. Okay. So this is a good one for Dr. Levinson to explain. This seems to suggest to me that the agent of God's presence and his Holy Spirit are one and the same because no one has been introduced between the agent of God's presence and the Holy Spirit. So what seems to be happening is the the Holy Spirit is taking on the identical role as the agent of God's presence. I think that's supported by the fact that it says they rebelled and pained his Holy Spirit. Because if you look back at Exodus 23, the language of the angel, you're not supposed to disobey that angel. And then what will happen according to Exodus 23, if you disobey that angel, God will become an, or if you obey the the angel, God will become an enemy to Israel's enemies. But here, God becomes an enemy, an enemy to Israel, because Israel is the one who has rebelled and paid against God's Holy Spirit. So I think two things are happening in this verse. Well, let's do the three things that are happening. The first thing that happens earlier is that the angel of Exodus 23 and the panim or presence of Exodus 33 are merged into one being, the angel or agent of God's presence. The second thing that happens is that moves from the agent of God's presence directly to his Holy Spirit. And so these two seem to be the same. And that seems to be the case three because the language of rebelling and enemy seems to come directly from Exodus 23. So you have here sort of a a riff on Exodus 23 combined with 33. And and what has happened is here, by the time you get to Isaiah 63, sort of this this either Neo-Babylonian context or Persian context, and clearly in the context of a communal lament, The language of Exodus 23 in the angel is taken up in Isaiah 63 and used against Israel itself. So the angel, the I'll just say angel, the angel of God's presence saved them, but they rebelled and pained his Holy Spirit. And here spirit seems to be understood as the angelic presence of God. And so the language in this verse, 6310, is very much the language of Exodus 23, 20 to 23. Rebellion against, in Exodus 23, the angel becomes rebellion against the Holy Spirit here. And God doesn't become an enemy to the enemies. God becomes an enemy to Israel. So this is clearly the language of Exodus 23 being used to indict Israel for what it's done, leading to the situation they find themselves in in the Neo-Babylonian or Persian era. When we continue, the next verse says, Then his people recalled the days of old, the days of Moses and his people, Where is he who brought them through the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who set his Holy Spirit among them? Yeah, and that's a difficult one to try to find a reference for because you have several references to Ruach in the Exodus account. You have, um, let's say, the, the artisans who are filled with the Ruach of wisdom in Exodus 28. You have Bezalel and Oholiab in Exodus 31 and 35, who 
are filled with spirit of wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and they become the heads of the artisans. Though it's hard to understand how that would be described as putting in their midst his Holy Spirit. Um, you also have in Numbers 11, the elders who help Moses with the civil suits and all the various lawsuits that are going on and the complaints of the people. And it's hard to know how that was putting in their midst his Holy Spirit. So in my opinion, now, Yeshaya, I may be dead wrong on this, but in my opinion, where is he who put in their midst his Holy Spirit is a reference to that angel. So God, um, the angel of God's presence rescued them, but they rebelled against his Holy Spirit. Where is the one who put in their midst, I would say, that Holy Spirit, the very one who was the angel of the presence intended to lead? How come no one is leading us now? Mm -hmm. The lament says. So I think this is a reference back to the angel of God's presence whom the people are rebelling against. Yes. And I can see how um, Christians looking back might read the Septuagint translation as more of, let's say, inside an individual person, yeah. um, within them, his Holy Spirit, whereas the Hebrew is more like among them or within their midst, within their community. Would you agree yes. with that? Absolutely. This is definitely a communal lament, and this is about the Holy Spirit placed within that community. Now that we are getting the hang of hearing in this lament how Isaiah is recalling details of the Exodus, your ears will hear even more in the final verses of the lament. So verse 12 says, He who sent his glorious arm of power to be at Moses' right hand, who divided the waters before them to gain for himself everlasting renown, who led them through the depths like the horse in the open country, they did not stumble. And here is the grand climax of the lament in verse 14. Like cattle that go down to the plain, they were given rest by the Spirit of the Lord. This is how you guided your people to make for yourself a glorious name. So the idea again in Exodus 33, we're not back at 23 with the angel, we're back in 33, we're up to 33, where Moses and God are arguing. God says, I'll send an angel, and that's not enough for Moses. Moses wants God to go. God doesn't want to go. God said, I'll destroy them if I go. And this is right after the golden calf. This is right in the middle of the golden calf episode. And then finally, God relents in Exodus 33, I think it's 16, and says, my presence, my panim, will go with you, and I will give you rest. So I think this verse is actually an adumbration of or an allusion to the promise of the panim, the presence of God, giving rest in Exodus 33. So in the beginning, you have the angel of God's presence in verse 9. That is a combination of the angel of Exodus 23 and the presence in Exodus 33, and they're combined in the angel of God's presence. In the next verse, they're identified, that angel of God's presence is identified with God's Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And then in the last verse of the lament, the reference is not to the angel, but to the presence. So you've moved from a combination of angel and presence, Exodus 23 and Exodus 33, to their rebelling against the angel, who is now the Holy Spirit. That's Exodus 23, but now it's the Holy Spirit. And then at the end, the spirit of the Lord gives them rest. That's now a reference back to Exodus 33. So you've moved from a combination of Exodus 23 and 33, the angel of God's presence, to the notion of rebelling an enemy against God's Holy Spirit. That's Exodus 23, now understood as the Holy Spirit. And then in the last lines, it's now the Spirit of the Lord understood in light of Exodus 33. 
So it comes full circle. It begins with Exodus 23, combined with Exodus 33. In the next verse, it moves to the language of Exodus 23, rebelling an enemy. And then it comes down in the end to Exodus 33, full circle. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it makes sense to me that this is all a reflection on Exodus, but now it's not angel in presence, it's the Holy Spirit who is there present in the Exodus tradition. This is one of the great things about the courses and the roundtable talks at Israel Bible Center. You get to carefully go through scripture, noticing new details along the way and having assumptions challenged, and you learn new ideas. If you love conversations like this, join us at Israel Bible Center, where you have access to many more courses and lots of roundtable talks that dig into the details of culture and interpretation of the Bible. You can even earn credit towards Israel Bible Center's certificate program in Jewish context and culture. Thank you to Jeremy McDonald from Mason Jar Music for doing a great job editing, mixing, and adding in all the good music for these episodes. And thank you for hanging out with me and being curious about all things Bible-related.